Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the weekly COVID-19 media briefing. I'm Carrie Schutte, the Public Information Officer for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. I'll start as we always do with the numbers. As of uh, March 15th, we've had 11,158 confirmed cases, including 21 from Monday. We have eight people hospitalized with COVID in Shasta County, including two who are in the intensive care unit. We have um, fewer than um, 100 in isolation, which is a nice number to see. We've got an estimated 98 people in isolation. Right now, um, our available regional ICU capacity, that number is updated weekly, is 25.8%, and that reflects capacity in 11 Northern California counties, not just Shasta County. So that number may or may not change as our numbers in Shasta County go up or down. And we have had a total of 194 Shasta County residents who have died from COVID-19. With us today, we have Robin Schurig, the Director of the Public Health Branch of the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. Dr. Karen Ramstrom is our County Health Officer. We've got Dean Germano from Shasta Community Health Center, Robert Folden from Mercy Medical Center Reading, Glenn Hayward from Reading Rancheria, and Mark Mitchelson from Shasta Regional Medical Center. Thank you everyone for being with us today, and I would love to go to Robin to start us out. All right, thank you, good morning. I don't have a whole lot to share this morning. I will just share the latest tier assignment data that was announced yesterday. We continue to be in the red tier. Our case rate decreased from 5.9 last week to 5.0 daily cases per 100,000 population this week. And our test positivity also decreased from 2.5% last week to 2.0% this week. Both of those metrics are within the ranges of the red tier. So while we don't qualify for a move to the orange tier just yet, we're also not in danger of moving back to the purple right now. Our data is headed in the right direction and let's help it stay that way by continuing to mask and distance, get tested and get vaccinated when it's your turn. That's all I have this morning. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ramstrom. Hey, good morning, everybody. I thought I would give a little bit of an update on our vaccine efforts this morning. Um, we're seeing a steady um, but gradual increase in our vaccine supply um, um, week to week. Um, so far, we've been at, um, allocated for the county approximately uh, 50, 53,000 doses. To date, um, we, re we received our first um, allocation of the Janssen vaccine last week. That's 1,400 doses. And then we'll get our next allocation of that next week. We're continuing to um, have conversations with our vaccine providers about the best use of the Janssen vaccine while it's still limited supply. But um, we look forward to being able to make that available in the community. Um, in addition to the county supply, um, there are some new federal um, allocations um, that are being received within the county, which is um, adding to our numbers of doses available. Um, some of our pharmacies, new pharmacies are coming on, <clears throat> and we have um, some of our FQHCs are going to start receiving um, vaccine directly from the federal government. And so um, we are in this place where we're starting to see supply um, increase, and we expect that to go up even more so, uh, much more so in April. As far as um, how many doses we've um, administered in the county, sorry, um, we, um, excluding the skilled nursing facilities and assisted living, um, we don't have that data um, to, to date, uh, fully vaccinated over 36,000 um, individuals, <clears throat> um, which, is, which is really um, good uh, progress. Um, and our vaccine capacity is also growing. We're having additional vaccine providers come on, as I said, some of the pharmacies. Um, Safeway is um, doing a couple large clinics a week now um, in uh, partnership with um, public health. I'm out at Shasta College. They're able to do about 500 doses per clinic. Um, as you heard last week, um, Reading Rancheria had their first big clinic, so that was great um, for the community. Um, uh, we're partnering with Rite Aid to provide vaccination to some vulnerable groups um, over a series of weekends at three of the store locations. Um, and uh, they're gonna do about 800 people per weekend and we'll do um, two rounds of that um, to get people fully vaccinated a second dose. Um, Shasta Community Health Center is a, continues to be a wonderful partner. Um, so, and Dean, you could speak to this too. Starting to reach some of our uh, more mobile populations um, started with some vaccinations at the Good News Rescue Mission last week using the Yonsen single dose vaccine. Um, we're requesting one of our um, COVID-19 testing sites be converted to a vaccine um, 
clinic. So that's very exciting. Um, that would give us some increased capacity, um, potentially up to 400 doses a day. Um, and then in terms of eligible groups, who are we vaccinating? So we're continuing to vaccinate phase 1A healthcare personnel, um, phase 1B um, individuals who are working in emergency um, services, um, um, education and child care, and food and agriculture. Um, and then this week we've added um, individuals 16 and older who are at particularly high risk of severe COVID-19 due to underlying health conditions or disabilities. And um, so that's a new group just this week. <clears throat> so we're looking forward to be able to get those vulnerable populations vaccinated as well. And happy to um, take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Do any of our healthcare partners have anything to share this morning before we open to media questions? I'm seeing no, 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 and no. Okay. Um, we are ready for media questions. Well, I'd like to ask uh, Robin, uh, she looks like she did a lot of work compiling statistics and graphs and everything that she presented at the Board of Supervisors meeting yesterday. What did you learn uh, through all that, Robin? What, what have we found out? So first, I just want to give credit to our epidemiology team because they are the ones who actually did a lot of work to put that together. I just presented it. Um, but yeah, I think what we learned is that while the majority of both our hospitalizations and deaths have occurred in the older population and people with underlying health conditions. They do include, they, bo they both do include some relatively young and otherwise healthy people. And so I think that's what we have learned is that as we expected, you know, people who are at the highest risk for severe illness and death are those who are either older or have underlying conditions, but it can strike, you know, younger and healthy people as well. So I think it just reinforces the need to be careful. What surprised you? Um, <laughs> you may have stumped me with that one, Mike. Um, honestly, I mean, I think we saw what we expected to see. I don't know if uh, Dr. Ramstrom, if you want to speak to anything that was surprising to you in the data, but I don't know that I was surprised by it. We we also have been monitoring it over time, so you know, we sort of knew what to expect when we looked at it. I guess I would just say, um, I, yeah, I agree with Robin. We have been monitoring this, um, but I, I would say, and I don't have the exact figures in, in front of me, but um, older adults are dramatically at higher risk of, of death. And, um, you know, and this includes people who are being really careful, but somehow otherwise are getting exposed. And so um, that definitely came through when um, our epidemiologist compiled that data for us. All right. Thank you both. Hi, this is uh, David Benda with the Record Searchlight. Um, I had a couple questions about the vaccine rollout. So, Dr. Ramstrom, you said that the county's been allocated uh, about 53,000 doses to date and has been able to inoculate around 36,500 people. So, the question is, um, why hasn't that um, 36,500 number, how, how come that hasn't caught up with the amount of doses you've uh, uh, you've been allocated. What are, what, what are the reasons, some of the factors with that? Yeah, you know, and we've been hesitant to share that. That's from our vaccine registry, the statewide vaccine registry, and it's an undercount. And so that's been a concern since we've started um, vaccination, um, this vaccination effort. Um, like I said, it's not capturing, um, it's not capturing some of the pharmacies because that data goes to their corporate offices for entry and it's either delayed or not being captured. Um, we're still trying to figure out if all of our skilled nursing facility and assisted living uh, federal pharmacy partnership vaccinations are in there because they um, are reporting back to CDC, um, the vaccine doses administered. And so it's an undercount. And so we're sort of in the process of trying to figure out how can we gather those additional um, efforts to count them in our numbers. Um, and so the numbers that I shared are really reflecting sort of our local efforts, not some of those um, federal programs. Um, and we're hoping to be able to tease that apart more as we go forward um, to give more accurate um, information. I will say that the vaccine that we provide week to week, we ask our vaccine providers, what can you do this week? What can you do over the next week? And what do you, you know, how many doses can you use? And that's that's kind of how we've been allocating is based on what 
providers can do over the next week or so. And um, doses are used just about that quickly. Um, and so um, the doses that we've pushed out are, are a pretty good reflection of the number of doses that have been administered. Um, and then can you speak to some of the, at least the news reports, the disparity, the vaccine rollout from county to county. I mean, I think Butte County started vaccinating teachers, oh, maybe a month before Shasta County. I just read today where Solano County is gonna start vaccinating individuals who are 50 and older, um, which, you know, from the outside looking in, um, seems that those counties are, you know, being a little more efficient in getting these shots out. Um, can you speak to that? Anybody? You know, I think it's hard to compare county to county and um, and there are different factors, I think, that determine which groups are prioritized and there's sort of, some of them are done simultaneously and it's just, it, every community is a little bit different. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with what we've done. We've used the vaccine supply that we've been provided um, we actually had our first round of vaccinating all interested teachers completed, um, gosh, it's probably a month ago now. Um, we um, are making really good progress in vaccinating the most vulnerable communities and our staff are even, we wanna even ask the state, can we move? So that's the lowest healthy places index quartile. We're supposed to use 40% of our doses for that group. We wanna ask the state if we can move up to the next um, uh, quartile, um, second to the lowest um, highest risk, um, because we feel like we're making such good progress in those communities. So um, I, I think every community is just a little bit different in terms of how this is playing out based on what sectors they have and how many they have in those sectors. Um, but I, I'm very comfortable and I commend our vaccine providers they have been working their petitions off. It's like, it's a lot of work and it's been constant every week, every weekend. Um, and um, I just wanna send a big thank you to them. I don't think that we could do more, honestly. And we are continuing to increase the number of um, vaccination options as I described, getting prepared for next month when we see more supplies come in. I mean, would it be fair because again, you, you see some of these counties that are getting, um, you know, other groups vaccinated quicker and, and from the outside looking in, I, you think, well, they're, maybe they're getting more, more doses. Is, is that a fair characterization of why that's happening and, and why are they getting more doses than maybe Shasta County? You know, all I can speak to is what how the state describes their allocation methods to us. And early on, you know, it was by sector. And we can see, you know, how our sector numbers, our healthcare workers, that was how we were initially allocated. And then it went to age-based allocations. And so those um, demographics vary across counties. And so that influences the, the number of doses that are given to each county. And this question has come up. Um, you know, we, we've kind of inquired with the state, we've asked about methodology, we've been informed about methodology, we've looked at their data, and, um, you know, all, all I can say is that we've asked the question to make sure we're getting our fair share and feel comfortable that our, our allocation reflects our population and um, are doing our best to get out the vaccine that we have. Um, so I can't, I can't really speak to it more than that. And then one quick question. You mentioned at the supervisor's meeting that um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, you've been allocated about 1,400 doses. You're gonna be, uh, wanna make sure this is correct. Um, the focus will be uh, getting those initial shots to people who are logistically challenged to getting a second dose. Is that, is that still the, the case? Yeah, that, that's the case until we have more doses available. And also for people who have some sort of a contraindication to the mRNA vaccine and um, so we're, we're focusing on mobile populations, um, um, our homebound individuals, um, 
people that might be hard to nail down and maybe they, they live in different areas or they work in different areas and might be hard to schedule for a second clinic. Um, we're working um, on talking to our hospitals about um, discharge, using them at patient discharge. Um, the one dose, get the individual vaccinated, especially if they're being discharged to a long-term care facility. So those are some of the some of the uses that we've that we've talked about, and we know that our vaccine providers are interested in. It's like Dean wants to weigh in too. Yeah, I, I can I can just add that uh, as an example, we had a uh, a vaccine uh, clinic at the Mission last Friday, and uh, we 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 basically uh, were able to get the uh, the J and J uh, vaccine to about fifty five individuals at that. And that's a targeted population that's high risk, and uh, we'll be continuing to do that over the next several Fridays, not just at the mission, but at some of the camps and other places around where uh, we get to and taking care of those folks. So there, there's one example of, a, of its use. Thank you. That's all I have. I appreciate it. Dave, I also wanted to add to your uh, question about the how in some cases some populations may be vaccinated earlier or later in different counties. And I and I just wanted you to know that that we get questions all the time, weekly, if not daily, from people from other counties saying, Hey, I see that you're vaccinating this group and my county's not quite there yet. So can I come and get my vaccine there? So I would imagine that any county that you talk to is going to have, um, is going to tell you that, you know, this group was vaccinated sooner in a different county than my county. So I don't think that, um, I, I just wanted to, to make sure that that is clear that, um, that we're all generally using the same state rollout system. We're all supposed to be using the state rollout system. I know that we're using it here in Shasta County. And so while a group may be a little bit sooner or later than another group, um, I, I don't think that there's any sort of major difference between um, our county and other counties um, our size. Any other media questions this morning? Uh, I've got a question for uh, Dr. Ramstrom. Um, what advice do you give to people who have already had COVID as far as being vaccinated? Thank you for bringing that up, Mike. That's a good reminder. Um, so vaccination is recommended for people with a history of having um, COVID-19, um, in part because we don't really know um, how long natural immunity will last. And we also know that there's variability in, the, in how um, strong natural immunity is from person to person, depending on um, how much um, virus they were exposed to, severity of illness and that kind of a thing. And um, we're still learning more about that. And we know that the vaccine actually provides a robust immune response and enough that it would be protective uh, against some of the variants that we um, are anticipating to be coming um, to uh, become more, more prevalent in our community. So um, it is recommended that people with a past history, um, it, in, it is, um, advise that people wait until they're not infectious anymore so they don't expose people at the vaccine clinic. Um, and they may wait up to 90 days after they've actually um, have been infected um, because it's expected that their immunity will be protective at least for that period of time um, after which um, vaccination is, is recommended. But they can be vaccinated anytime after their infectious period um, results. I have heard, and of course you're the doctor, but I've heard from people that um, it may not be good to get one right away because of your immune system and it would kind of act like how the second shot does to some people, you know, where you would have more severe symptoms after the, the vaccination. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good theory. I haven't seen that yet um, in terms of like in our, in the V-Safe Revere's data. I will say that that the, um, the post-vaccine monitoring data does show that people after a second dose do have more of those symptoms like um, pain, a pain in their arm or um, feeling um, achy or feverish or headache, that seems to be more prevalent in the second, uh, with the second dose. And so it may be similar um, type of response um, with the um, vaccine in somebody who has a previous infection, um, but not, it's not worrisome. It just, it's showing the immune response to that vaccine. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Annie here from Channel 12. Um, I just wanted to follow up on some things. Um, Dr. Ranstrom, this is for you. Um, you know, we've been talking about vaccination phases. Um, I think you touched on it a little bit, but when can that 16 to 64 year old group um, expect to, uh, with underlying health conditions, expect to, you know, get their vaccines? Has that process already started? Yeah, the process has already started. So um, uh, an alert, a provider bulletin went out to our healthcare community oh, a good couple of weeks ago about that. We actually have notified our healthcare providers. We sent something out today. Um, and we are working with certain some of our local partners who take care of some of those patients to get them referred to some of our clinics. So it's in the works right now. Perfect. And then I just wanted to ask too, you know, um, we're still in phase 1B. And, you know, there's a lot of people I talk to in the community who are patiently waiting their turn, but of course they're feeling frustrated, especially for people in the next phases. Um, when can we expect to see ourselves hitting that phase 1C, the next sector of the rollout plan? Yeah, I'm not sure on exactly on timing, but my sense is it's going to be, okay, now everybody else. <laughs> I think that's going to be the next group. Um, and uh, probably not until well into April, I'm guessing that's when we're going to have more supply. Um, as you know, um, federal government saying in May, um, and so they may have a, a more of an idea about vaccine supply that's coming. So um, somewhere around that time frame, I anticipate that happening. Yeah, I, I would just add that the limiting factor all along here has been mostly the availability of the vaccine. So as soon as you, you know, you you overcome that, then it's making sure we have the infrastructure to deliver, um, you know, deliver the vaccines. And and some of our colleagues here have been, you know, are have been doing that. And others like myself and other uh, the, like some of the health centers are having to gear up to be able to do it on a larger scale. We are also depending to some degree on the the um, um, my turn uh, platform, which uh, has its own issues that we're we're hoping are going to get resolved because we need a um, we need a scheduling system that we can rely on and uh, an inventory and uh, an ability to feed data to multiple data sites in an efficient way. So there's some some steps yet to go. Thank you. And then I just had some, I had sorry I have a couple more questions here. Dr. Ransom, you also mentioned requesting the state to convert your COVID testing site into a vaccination site of our state testing site. You'll be turning that into a vaccine site. Yep, that's what we're that's what we requested. Um, I don't know the timeline. Hopefully soon um, we'll be continuing to follow up with them to see what the timeline is on that. Perfect. Thank you. And actually, I had a follow up here for the Reading Rancheria. You know, you guys had your mass vaccination clinic on Sunday. How many people there were you guys able to get vaccinated? Uh, we vaccinated 880. Uh, we include, that includes 100 walk ups that uh, didn't have appointments, but they showed up wanting the vaccine. So we vaccinated an additional 100 people. Um, and we actually have set up another one for the 27th of this March. Uh, we're going to do a thousand of the J and J vaccines for the general public as well. And for that next uh, clinic, sorry, Glenn, will they be able? Do they still need to call in, or will there be a better system for them to schedule appointments? You mentioned, you know, your phone system had crashed the first time. Heck, no. We learned a lot from that one. Uh, that was uh, not a smart move to have uh, fifty thousand people call your phone lines. So we learned from that. Uh, we have an online registration site that is uh, on our website at rrths.org. And it says, book your COVID vaccine now. You can pick the time you want and uh, go from there. It makes it a lot easier. And uh, I have less headaches of all of our phone systems being shut down. Perfect. Um, so also I just wanted to go back to you, Dr. Ranstrom as well. Uh, I'm going back to the 36,000 people vaccinated, how David was talking. I just wanted to clarify that that number, like you said, is just an undercount because um, it's not exactly capturing all the people like the skilled nursing facilities who are getting vaccinated, correct? Yeah, we're, we're still working to uh, make that data more complete, um, but it didn't feel right not sharing it at all. Um, so we're just sharing it with letting you know the limitations. We know at least that many have been fully vaccinated and um, or with doses administered. So, um, we hope to have more information and more complete data um, as soon as possible. 
Thank you. And then, you know, it is St. Patrick's Day today, which is a day where a lot of people would like to go out to the bars and stuff. I guess my question is also, what's the message for the community since under the red tier um, bars that don't serve food are not allowed to be open today or allowed to be open? I think that would be the message that bars that don't serve food are not supposed to be open right now at all, um, not even outdoors. And so, yeah, if you're going to go out, we would encourage you to, you know, partake of businesses that are following the rules. Um, and we really would encourage people to continue to stay home as much as possible and make sure that you're distancing and masking when you do go out. Robin, and this one's also for you. Um, you know, obviously, people might have that urge to still want to go out. Can we see that, you know, we've been doing so well, Shasta County, our numbers have been great. Um, is there that concern that if people do choose to go out today, we'll see the effects like we saw post holidays? I think that's always a possibility. Um, we didn't end up seeing a surge after New Year's like we were sort of anticipating. We definitely did see surges after Thanksgiving and Christmas as well as Halloween prior to that. Um, but so, you know, I don't have huge concerns about St. Patrick's Day. I don't think that it, that as many people go out and get together as they do for, say, Christmas, but it's always a possibility. So, yeah, again, we just encourage people to continue to stay home as much as possible until we can get the vaccine out to more people. I think that's kind of it. Thank you. All right. Any other media questions? Okay, I have a few questions from the public. I'm going to, I don't completely understand this question, so I'm just going to read it verbatim and um, hope, Dr. Ramstrom, that you can um, answer this one for us. Um, regarding the antibody dependent enhancement expected in three to six month death disaster from mRNA, can Dr. Ramstrom explain why this will or will not occur with these mRNA? experimental injections, also known as the cytokine storm reaction. Several doctors discussed this impending mass horror in front uh, with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, DO, in forefront of this coding and programming of synthetic spike protein. Here's the question. Clarify where in the informed consent is this possibility addressed as millions predicted to die from this never done before inoculation? So I guess I would just say that um, with actual uh, COVID-19 illness, um, there definitely is an inflammatory component from your body fighting off that virus, um, which is different than actually being exposed to a little snippet of the spike protein to cause an, an immune response so that you can fight it off. And so um, we are worried about people who've had COVID-19 having um, ongoing symptoms um, from this immune response and other aspects of the infection. Um, with long COVID, um, but I uh, have not heard of any concerns with that with regard to the vaccine. And um, if you uh, look at the CDC and FDA um, fact sheets, um, you know, they, they list what the vaccine reactions have been, and that has not been a um, concern. All right, thank you. Um, this one, the question is, because death is clearly listed on Pfizer and Moderna provider vaccinator sheets, when will it be added to the patient client fact sheet to ensure a transparent informed consent? So, so death has not been associated with the vaccine and the vaccine trials. And we really rely on um, CDC and the FDA actually produces their fact sheets um, and that we're required to use. And so those are not our documents. Um, so we rely on the FDA to update those and make the most current one available that when we vaccinate individuals. Great, thank you. And we do post all of those materials on our website. Um, okay, and the last one it, from this person is explain why the blood serology test is not pushed as the far more accurate test for antibodies versus the PCR research tool for genetic sequencing. Are, aren't sequencing, aren't the antibodies what would prove the person has desired immunity herd status, thus no need to be in a max, mass vaccination experiment? Why the big push for swabbing by PCR and blood tests? There's a few questions in there, but hopefully you were able to grab those out. 
Yeah, I would just say that PCR or other um, NAT tests are what's recommended for diagnostic testing to diagnose um, COVID-19. Uh, antibody testing is not um, indicated for uh, as a diagnostic tool. Um, and uh, antibody testing is not indicated to make decisions about um, vaccination um, because it's not giving the full picture. And as I said before, even if somebody has actually had um, past infection, immunity can wane. We don't know how long it lasts. We don't know if it's going to protect against the variants. And so we recommend uh, vaccination regardless of those test results. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then there was one more that says, the vast majority of those who die from COVID-19 in Shasta County are people over age 60. Throughout the pandemic, the county has reported daily by age the number of people who test positive for the virus. Given that early intervention with monoclonal antibody treatment has shown promise and Shasta County hospitals have this drug in supply, is the county providing this information to all patients 60 years of age and older when they do contact tracing? so they can advocate to get this drug early and help prevent the onset of serious illness, hospitalization, and death. This infusion treatment is a game changer for early in intervention and is likely being underutilized in Shasta County because high-risk people over age 60 don't know about it. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say, so our, our case investigators and contact tracers um, always recommend people who have symptoms and are feeling well to contact their healthcare provider. And um, it's symptomatic individuals um, early in infection that would be candidates um, that meet certain criteria for that treatment. We agree, we want to maximize use of that, of that treatment for um, people um, who are sick and um, have been working with our healthcare provider system to look at opportunities to make that more accessible. But we are currently, you know, our hospitals are doing that treatment and are um, available um, to community providers who want to refer um, patients for that through our infectious disease providers. Great. Dean, did you have something to add? Well, we regularly, our chief medical officer regularly communicates the uh, that information to our providers on, on staff that this is available, these are the situations where it's appropriate, this is how you start you, you move it along to get to, uh, for example, you, you need to consult with the infectious disease doctor on call, that kind of thing. So I, I know that we've, and I'm sure all the other groups as well, has spread this information widely. And um, as, as patients contact them, it's one of, the, one of the tools they have to work with. All right. And I just got one more question on the hotline that says, if I tested positive but didn't develop antibodies, I assume that means they took an antibody test and it came out negative, would that mean that it was a false positive test? You know, no, not necessarily. Um, we don't really um, know, and I don't know what kind of test uh, the individual had. Um, it's hard to say. I don't know if she um, was sick with COVID symptoms and if it was an antigen or an, a PCR test. Um, um, but we also don't really know, um, and there's variability in how long the antibody tests um, show um, are positive. And so there's a lot of factors there. All right. Those are all the questions that I have. Do Did any of our media um, folks have any additional questions that came up between the last time we chatted and now? All right, anything else from our experts? All right, hearing none. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be back again next Wednesday. If you have any questions, go ahead and then send those to COVID-19 at co.shasta.ca.us. Everyone have a safe and healthy week.